Can everyone see my screen now? Looks good. Yep. Yeah, so um, thanks for um, Chen's introduction and uh, um, we're glad to have this virtual talk. So, so today I'm going to talk about learning visual knowledge from pilot image and text data. Um, this is um, some of work with my students and also with our collaborators. Um, I might have to skip a few slides because we're 15 minutes late. So I would like this uh, seminar to be a little bit more interactive. So if you have any questions, just post that on your chat box. So unfortunately I only have a, a single monitor. So I'll pass um, from time to time to see if I got any questions there. So let's get started. Um, and uh, before we really look at any of the um, tech details, let's uh, look at this image and trying to figure out what's happening here. Now, if you've never seen this, um, a lot of things doesn't make sense because you really see a dark image with some vehicle um, like object in the middle. Um, so I used to pause here for a moment and ask questions, but I think we're just go through, going through that part. So let's say this image by itself probably does not make a lot of sense to you. But now let me show you the caption or the sentence associated with this image. So it reads like at 2,700 meters below sea level, the remotely operated vehicle Hacleus explores the seabed looking for hydrothermal fluid vents. Now, by reading this caption, so a lot of things will now make sense within this image. So for example, if you look at this vehicle in the middle, um, you'll know that the sort of guess that this is a remotely operated vehicle called Hacleus. Now, obviously this is a seabed and this weird shaped object, maybe this hydrothermal fluid vents. And by the way, this hydrothermal fluid vents is a total alien, almost like an alien concept to me. But if you keep reading this article, there's another figure within the same web page that trying to explain what is this hydrothermal fluid vents. Um, now it turns out those are chimney like architecture produced by the interaction of the cold sea water with the hot rocks on the seabed. Now they have this image and the new sort of the caption over there. Now you can sort of see, okay, this must be the new concept of hydrothermal fluid vents. And in fact, you can even associate um, those two regions that look quite different from those two images. So what I'm showing you is this example where you can look at an image and the text data associated with the image and trying to make sense of the image content. So I've been working on computer vision for um, some time. Now, this is very exciting for me because why? Because we have a lot of these data over the internet, right? If we can solve visual recognition by just asking a model to look at those images and their text descriptions, then, then um, you know, looks like a very appealing solution because um, I was quoting some number here. I think for every single minute, there's about 150 thousand images being uploaded to Facebook, generating over half a million text descriptions from the users. Now we're probably 20 minutes into this talk because I'm late by 15 minutes. So that is about three million images and uh, tens of millions of you know, text data, right? So if we can really leverage <coughs> this vehicle of image and text data to learn something interesting, and, and, and to recognize a large number of concepts, that's a truly sort of a powerful and exciting approach. Right. So I think for the majority of this talk, when we talk about some of the work or some of the effort that trying to learn from image and text data or powered image and text data. So this talk will have two major components. Um, so in the first part, we're going to talk about how we're going to learn from those image text data. And the second part, we're going to slightly switch gear and um, really think about what's the 
limitation of just learning from image and text and to look at how we can learn by actively interacting with our work. So let's uh, get really dive into some of the technical details here. So the first part of the talk, um, we're gonna talk about, or look at some work we've done on visual grounding. Um, let's sort of travel back in time about seven years ago. At that time, vision and language is not a sort of a major topic in vision, but at least at that time, there is this very popular topic called image search, right? So you can, you can input some text description and uh, the expected output is sort of sentences that are relevant to this text, text description. And this is a paper from Faith Group, actually from Jonathan, um, from Justin Jonathan, who's now in Michigan, who did this work on um, in text search. And uh, these are the results he showed from a famous search engine. At that time, that search engine isn't working really well. If you input this sentence called men holding fish and wearing hat on white boat, and a lot of images are somewhat irrelevant. Now I tried that a couple of days ago, tried to the, try <clears throat> the same sort of a text theory into one of the famous search engine. Now the results are much better. Right? Now the fun fact is that somehow if you look at the third image here, <laughs> you see exactly the same image from that paper. So our search engine are getting much better in terms of figure out the meaning of the text data in terms of finding relevant images, but they still have issues. Right. So let's look, really start to look at this, think about this problem called image text matching and talk about some of the older work um, we have done and start from there to look at some of the newer effort within the community and from our group. So here's a very simple task. The task is that either you have um, you have some sort of text query lies on the right hand side. You have some images in your database, and by the way, this is an image taken at Wisconsin about forty years ago. Well, the question is, how can you build a link to say, okay, so if I input the text query on the right hand side, I should get relevant sort of images from the database uh, from the left hand side. So. Um, this is what we did about seven years ago. Um, and Li Wei, um, who was a pretty soon, was Lana at uh, UIUC, now a faculty member at UHK. So um, we had a, well, in fact, that's, uh, I think, the first time I met Chen, almost. <laughs> so we have this very simple idea. Um, so how about we just learn some embedding to represent both the image and text data? The idea is that, you know, you have those image, you can embed the image using some neural network. You get some vector representation of this image. You now you have this text data, you're gonna embed the text data into some embedding and uh, you're gonna compile them in this embedding space and put some loss on top of that. Either that's a sort of a triple loss or ranking loss or similarity score, that type of thing. And um, you can train this model on a lot of image and text data, and uh, then you get a, a model for image text retrieval. So at that time, this is a idea that works pretty well that get incorporated in some of the, the products in, uh, for some of the companies. We sort of move forward and trying to see, okay, so instead of just doing image and text query, can we look at image regions and uh, sort of tokens within the text query, right? So the idea here is that uh, this free scrounding problem, here we're given an image and a text description. We're gonna try to figure out which part within this region of the image corresponded to which of the phrases or tokens within the text description. Um, and the thing we're doing is almost exactly the same, we take features from different parts of this image. We're trying to match those feature embeddings to different embeddings of those phrases using exactly the same 
architecture here. Right. Now, a bit sort of pause here because um, those are all our old work. And to some extent today, they're becoming irrelevant or still relevant. Why? Because at 2022 or 2021, now we have this very powerful vision language model called CLIP, stands for um, Contrastive Language um, Vision Language Portraying. So essentially, it takes an idea that is similar to our previous approach. You get a bunch of images and a bunch of their text descriptions. You encode those images into some feature vector and encode the text disk, uh, um, input your, your text into some you know, text embeddings and you're trying to compute the similarity using some contrastive loss. And once learned, uh, you get two things. You get the image encoder so that you can extract features from image. You also get the text encoder so you can sort of uh, extract concepts, right? And uh, by doing so, you can actually do zero shot recognition. What you do is that you embed individual categories into these concepts using the text encoder and compile that against the features from the um, from image encoder. And then you can you know, figure out what kind of concept occurs in this image. So I'm gonna pause here to see if we have any questions from the audience. No. This is less exciting to some extent. Well, it's very exciting because this is the first time you know, this very simple idea could really work very well on a large um, range of data sets. So those are the results from CLIP. They tried on different data sets, you know, tried on ImageNet, tried uh, you know, Kinetics, this is for action recognition. And they tried on you know, those, those fine-grained data sets that are trying to recognize you know, different species of um, animals and, uh, and, and plants. Right, so very impressive. Now, so the time we saw this quick paper, we're saying, well, it's really impressive. Now, how about we use the same model to recognize individual image regions instead of the whole image? Right, so intuitive idea, because we tried previously to do the sort of free scrounding using the same idea, then how about we do the following? We take the image and take some sort of proposals, object proposals. Those are candidate regions within this image. So then to somehow figure out a way to resize those image into the same format that CLIP can accept and just send this into the CLIP model and compel the, the visual feature of this region. Those are region features against a large set of concept. Now, essentially what we did is very similar to the early work of region-based convolutional neural network. Now here, we're not doing the CNNs or doing the CLIP, which might be a transformer-based model. Right? Then we post this object detection into a classification problem. Right? So you can imagine you crop a lot of those regions and uh, send that into CLIP and trying to figure out which of the um, object category this region is coming from, and thus you can detect those object instances to some extent. So now if you look at the performance just by look, you know, using this naive idea, the clip, um, so clip have pretty high accuracy when you're trying to do zero shot image recognition, uh, image net, it says that's around 60%-ish, impressive. But now if you trying to do this, region clip idea and trying to recognize those objects on Elvis, which roughly have a thousand you know, categories, you know, similar to similar image net, you see a, a very large performance drop from 60% to 60 to 20 percent uh, Yeah, a quick question. Uh, do you feel the y-axis uh, in the figure you show here are comparable? So, um, I think that's a good question. There's two, well, there's a, a few aspects we can look at. So if you look at the number of categories, they're roughly the same. Now, if you look at the complexity, now record that this is 
Um, so, okay, so I have to, you know, <laughs> say a little bit more. So here, what we do is that we send the ground truth box of those, bo um, of those uh, objects on Elvis data set for classification. So we sort of rule out the background interference. Now, this additional factor, which is not captured in this slide, is that many of the objects on Elvis have much smaller or much lower resolution. So that's a confounding factor here. But other than that, I think this is a clean experiment. Like, well, imminent, you know, if you think about imminent, even imminent don't even have boxes, but most of the objects are centered. Now, think about this Elvis experiment. We manually crop the object to make it centered at you know, these local image patches and send that to clip. Now, um, and they have you know, roughly the same number of categories. I do admit that the resolution is much lower. So that, to some extent, might explain this drop. But um, we'll see more evidence as um, probably towards the later part of my slides to see you know, what's going on here. Thanks. So now the one of the questions we're interested in is to see whether we can um, sort of learn region representations using this vision language per training idea. So, and this is work um, with my son, Iru, who did this initiative at Microsoft and was a bunch of collaborators at Microsoft. So we propose this model called region clip. So think about clip as a trying to match image and uh, the global description of this image. We're trying to match images or regions within the images with respect to the sort of phrases um, within the text descriptions. I think Iwu is here. Um, okay. So um, now here's some of the um, sort of barriers we have. One of the challenges is that we don't really have those region descriptors because it's easy to grab images and captions. It's much more challenging to figure out or ask human to annotate which region correspond to which part of the text description. Now, our key idea is that, you know, look, you know, we already have this portraying click model, which is pretty good at matching, you know, images to synthesis. Why don't we just bootstrap from this portraying click model to create some sort of pseudo labels plus some NLP tricks so that we can generate region text panels for training. And, um, and that's what exactly we do. And we show that if we do this, you can learn those region representations that allows you to do region-based written tasks, including zero shot and open vocabulary object detection. So a very quick sort of a overview of what we do. So we first take the train clip model, this is from OpenAI, and uh, we take the sort of the both the, the language encoder and the visual encoder. Now, what we're interested in is to learn a new visual encoder defined over the sort of image regions instead of the whole image. I'm going to reuse the language encoder to encode language because um, arguably that part doesn't change much. So what we do is that we first take those images and we run some sort of object proposal. Um, those could be sort of low-level feature base or another deep neural network. So we got a bunch of, or even in our experiment, we show that you can just do random crop. Now, you crop the image based on some guidance. You get a bunch of local image regions. Those are candidates of the objects. And you can run the parser over the corresponding caption to convert them into sort of the, uh, the phrases right? and with some text prompting. So you can get candidate region descriptions and you can get candidate image regions. So what we do is that now we sort of wrong. Jin, may I ask another question? Yes. Uh, so first of all, where did you get the bounding boxes? Is it supervised? Is it annotated? So we try different things. So this is, you know, this is a very old line of work uh, of your proposal generation, right? Um, mm -hmm. So in our experiment, the best results is given by a model that is trained with some boxes, those written mm -hmm. proposal network. But we also try to do random cropping. 
just you know crop you know some boxes of you know around the center, which seem to be you know, working almost equally well as a trained written proposal network. Well, at least you know for this per training staff. Mm -hmm. So there's you know there's two things. The per training you need those candidate regions, right? And then at test time you need proposals, also. Now, we figured out that in per training the quality of the proposal does not matter. At test time it still matters. So mm -hmm. you need high quality proposal in order to you know get those instances right. right. But at least for mm -hmm. training you can plug in any sort of region proposals. Maybe even mm -hmm. those things from selective search and uh, ad mm -hmm. box, those type of thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And follow a uh, quick follow up is that given a caption, how did you decide which words you want to expand to issue your region queries or region descriptions? So I think we passed all the nouns from the um, from the uh, the sentence and try to expand those nouns into proper phrases using time, some of the text prompt. So I think this is what we do. Got it. Okay. So now the idea here is that, you know, you have this Niagara encoder from Cliff and Vision encoder from there. Um, and what we're gonna do with that, we're gonna use our, our visual encoder, this, the, our learning target, right? So we're gonna you know, get the vision features from our visual encoder, get the language features from the clip language encoder. Um, uh, well, that, I think this part explains um, um, trans question. We have a concept pool of nouns and then we're trying to fill in um, the description using different prompts. Now, what we do is that we're trying to sort of supervise this model by generating some pseudo scores or pseudo labels. The way we do this is actually pretty straightforward. What we do is that we just run the sort of clipper trained visual encoder and the clipper trained language encoder, and using those features to match these images and their candidate regions. Now, as we already show in our previous experiment, though this matching could be a little bit noisy. So what we do is that we post this matching result as a soft target for training our model. And uh, we use contrast loss and trying to match everything to the... Um... So we, there's two loss functions. There's a, a distillation loss over the soft target, and there's a contrast loss over the hard target. And there's some sort of balancing between those two loss terms. And that's what we do. Well, in fact, it's a very simple model to some you know, extent. Now you can portray the model and then you can apply this model to downstream tasks. So we try two things. We first try this transfer learning setting. Well, you just take the, the this green box, those region features and fine tune that on the um, sort of a, a downstream object detection um, um, model or, or data set. And we also try some sort of zero shot learning that you can directly grab the encoder for both images and text and just match them, just like clip it. Our key intuition is that you can get sort of pretty reasonable or decent region representations by doing this sort of alignment and distill from noisy labels produced by clip. So I think I'm gonna just show the results here. Um, this is the open vocabulary object detection. So um, the setting will be the following. You take a per train model and fine tune that on some base categories. Okay. And then we evaluate this model on both base and novel categories. So base will be the same set of categories. Novel categories will be unseen categories. Here, so we're testing whether the detector will be able to detect those concepts that are not presented in the training set. Right. And uh, here are our results. And one of this, uh, our results are shown in the green bar here. Here we evaluate the AP um, and we break the AP into you know, AP on the normal category, the same categories, AP, AP on the base categories, 
AP on the normal categories and AP across everything. Um, the green bar is our results and uh, the yellow bar is a pretty strong baseline, um, which is that fast RCN was clipped. So overall, we have better performance. And in particular, we have much better performance for those knowable categories. For some reason, if you tune clip on this task, right? So it's sort of doing pretty well on the base category, but doesn't do well on the knowable category. So there's a forgetting issue in this case. Right, so I'm going to skip some of the results. Okay, zero shot. Um, but the same thing we did for image recognition. You can do the same thing for region recognition here. Um, this is a, a little bit of like a straw man experiment because we want to um, almost tear apart two factors. There's a factor about localization. There's a factor about recognition. Here, what we do is the following. What we do is we just use the ground truth boxes and directly evaluate the performance of using ground truth boxes for doing the detection then it sort of all boils down to some sort of a classification problem. Right? And, uh, and this is zero shot, meaning that uh, the model is not trained any part of this particular data set. And this is, I think, Coco. So, and I think this MAP at um, uh, IOU equal to 0 0.5, I think. So um, now, so the baseline will be the clip model, which isn't doing you know, very terrible, actually doing pretty well on this task. And we show that we get a little bit of boost um, as you, you know, train bigger models on top of this. Some of the qualitative results, so you know, on the top we show the clip, the results from this clip plus um, the uh, ground truth boxes, just classify the ground truth boxes. And on the bottom, we show our model to classify those ground truth boxes. And uh, for some reason, the clip model consider that person as a type and, um, and also that umbrella as a surfboard, which is mean, you know, making some funny mistakes there. So here's the, um, the actual zero shot detection results. Here, here, we're not using the ground truth boxes anymore because we don't have the ground truth boxes. But we try this on, this, um, on the application data set. This is an egocentric so videos captured from the first person perspective. We run um, our proposal network for train uh, Coco, I think, and then plug in our model to classify these proposals. And here's the result, what this result look like. Now, you realize, a, um, those images have more objects than many of the images on, on Coco. B, our model missed a lot of the objects. But still, if you look at the detection outputs, um, those are fairly well impressive given that we never see any of the labels and data from this data set. And we never really see any correspondence between object boxes and their text descriptions. So, a quick summary here, um, we um, talked about some early idea of supervised uh, image and text matching and phrase grounding. And we talked about this region clip idea that trying to learn region level visual representation from some sort of a global alignment of image and text spells by bootstrapping from a latest vision language model. And we show that our region clip achieved new state of art results on zero shot and open vocabulary object detection tasks. Now, if you're interested, our code is available in this, under the brand name of Microsoft, is available on this GitHub repository. And we have a demo hosted on Hugging Face. Um, you're more than welcome to try it out. So I do realize that um, I have about probably 12 minutes left. So what I'll do is that I'll briefly talk about the second part. Again, you know, many of the work from you and then we'll quickly switch to the third part, which I think is a bit more interesting. So now, if you look at the region clip work, you'll say, well, now you can have this model, hopefully it could detect those individual objects. But if you look at the text description of image, here is an example shown here, we do have those individual objects, but we also have the relationship between the objects 
or between pile of objects, right? So children playing on the street, um, you know, children working on the street, and so on and so forth. The question is, can we sort of not only detect individual object concept, but also trying to figure out what's our, what are the relationships between piles of concepts? So this goes back to this idea of creating a graphical representation of the input image. This is called SYNGRAPH in the literature. The idea here is that you know, given input image, you begin to extract a graph. Well, each node on the graph is either a object or <clears throat> a relationship between a pair of objects. And if that node is an object, it has to be grounded within the image on the left-hand side. So this task is called SYNGRAPH generation. It's a localization plus recognition plus relationship recognition tasks. So in this work, I think, again, this is Iwu's work. What we do is um, the following. So imagine we only have image and text files. We have images and their text descriptions. Like I said, these are easy to grab from the internet. So can we train a model that can just consume this image and text corpus and we'll be able to extract the sync graph from any input image that is in fact grounded. Right? So that's our goal, right? We want to learn from those you know, tons of image and text files and at inference time given any input image, we can sort of round the inference to extract a grounded sync graph. Now, this is you know, some of the related work. You know, most of the people working on this single graph generation you know, problem, they consider fully supervised setting. And some of the recent work consider with the supervised setting, well, they don't have the actual localization of the single graph during training. And we're the first to consider this sort of weaker supervision or never supervised training. Well, during training, we only see the image and the image captions. So how are we going to do this? Now, it's, um, if you don't have any, anything linking the image and text data, this is really, really challenging and almost close to impossible. Now, luckily, or fortunately, we do have something to start with that is some sort of an object detector model. Now, think about our region clip work. It's some sort of object detector, right? Now. If you can afford to use <clears throat> any sort of object detector, then you know, that largely simplifies this problem because we can use the same idea we did in region clip and trying to create pseudo labels <clears throat> of those sync graphs. So what we do again is that we run language parser to pass the both the um, the subject object and predicates those triplets right, from the um, the text files or from the text data. And we run the object detector, see the region clip, for example, on the input image. Now, what that object detector gives you are boxes and their corresponding sort of object labels. Now you can sort of match these object labels to those triplets from your language parser using NLP techniques. So, and that will allow us to create pseudo label assignment, right? So for example, in this case, you can look at the pupil box and the orange box, right? And that box is matched to this triplet. So now you have this label of that pile of boxes and associated with women and working to bus. So that's a key idea, very simple. And I'm gonna skip the exact approach how we're doing this, and we're using the transformer network, so that's probably not surprising nowadays. Um, and just to quickly look at some of the results, um, I think the key results is actually summarized here. Um, so if you do a fully supervised method using exactly the same model, um, you get about 15-ish um, 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 top 100 recall. This is a very challenging task, by the way. And the state of our method um, that trains from sort of unlocalized syngraph, you still have the 
graph structures or supervision, but those graph nodes are not grounded, you get about 5.4% of accuracy. Now, if you run our model and only learn from image captions, you get about 7%. Those numbers are still you know, in their sort of infancy, but um, I think the relative performance gap sort of speaks. Now, we can also use our model by right, doing the unlocalized sync graph uh, for learning from the unlocalized sync graph, and that's the performance. We sort of almost double the state of art for, um, for this setting. So um, I'm going to skip those things. Those are some qualitative results um, that sort of compel the, 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 the output sync graph uh, from different supervision signals. Skip that and probably just briefly talk about this one here. So um, one of the reasons we're very interested in the sync graph generation task is that um, it's a, a very nice representation of the input image. It's a structure representation, right? So what we have is that you know, given this image, we can extract the sync graph, but the sync graph itself contains a lot of information. I think about as a large graph. So what we can do is that we can actually break this um, graph into different components. Right? Now think about image, right? Image have different sync components. And you think about the graph, you can break the graph into subgraphs. Now, our hope is that those individual scene components will be captured by different subgraph of the full scene graph. So for example, if you look at this input image, we have the men driving the boat, right? and we have people sitting on the bench. Now, if you look at the scene graph, we can break that into men, boat, and people on the bench. So that's a key idea. And this is some of the, some of the early work, assuming that you have some sort of reasonable scene graph detection or scene graph generation out results. What we do is that we design this model that will take the input image and um, sort of generate descriptions of local regions within this image. And more importantly, those descriptions are, oops, are grounded Right. So those are the actual results. So you can sort of ground things um, into their um, into the the ground the tokens of your caption into the individual regions of the um, image. I'm gonna skip this. More results. So if you look at the same input image, this is one of the subgraph we have, and uh, you can sort of generate the grounding and things like that. So on the left-hand side, we're showing the, um, the grounded scene graph, right? So you have a scene graph that is a sub-component of the scene graph that is grounded into the image regions. On the right-hand side, we're showing the generated captions was the, uh, was the grounding results. So it's trying to capture different um, components of the input image. Another one um, here. Now, Ian, you... just a quick reminder, we might have a heartbreak in yes. three minutes. So probably yeah. you can talk about that. Yeah, let's uh, just move to more exciting stuff. So if you really think about this clip model, um, it's a very interesting model, but this model has issues because the way this model is trained is almost like a couch potato. Uh, how this model is trained is that you ask this model to passively observe a lot of image data over internet and image and text data, right? So you just keep you know, sitting there and watch a lot of this image and text data. So in fact, you're gonna watch, ask models to watch over 400 million images and text data. Now, a fun fact is that a 14 years old child sees around 260 million images. So to some extent, this model is, sees more than a 14 years old child. But the model can still, you know, the clip model, despite the great success, can still make some of the sort of funny mistakes. 
So let's consider these two sentences, a man inserting an oil gun into the car and begin filling, and the man pull out a nozzle from the car and stop filling. Now if you, a normal human will look at these two sentences and say, look, so they're completely different, right? They describe almost adversary set of actions. Now, if you input this to the clip language encoder, the similarity score is at a level around 0 0.9, with a maximum of one. No, I think Yu discovered this, but we're not the only person who found this because there's a paper as you appeared this year talking about you can create those adversarial samples by carefully selecting your images and your text data such that it breaks almost all of those vision language models. They don't perform much better than chance. How are we gonna do this? Um, maybe we just look at the first column. You can say there's a mark and some graphs versus there's some graphs and a mark, right? So the mark and graphs will remain there, but the relationship, the relationship and the nouns are exactly the same, but the order is shuffled such that the image content is different. But the model will have a hard time to match them. One minute. So what we're trying to do is to move beyond this passive learning paradigm to really look at, think about how we learn those concepts of objects and actions from the first place. So imagine you're a six, month, six months old baby. So what you do is that you interact with the word and, and see you see visual inputs, right? So that's what we do. So we have been working on, no, let's just skip this. We've been working on recognizing and localizing actions from first person observations. I'm gonna fly through the slides because we're out of time. I'm gonna show the slides to, to Chen. So if you're interested, you can see the details there. So we also have those you know, hardware devices that are trying to track the detailed hand motion. Um, and we also have this, you know, on body sensing, trying to track the whole body motion. Right. So that's our visioning is that, yes, it's great that we have this opportunity of a lot of image and text data that will help us to learn very interesting representations and improve our known benchmark results. Right, so I'm going to skip that. But eventually we would like to move beyond this passive learning paradigm and move to this active learning Sort of regime so that we can indeed learn from our interactions. Uh, with that, I would like to end my talk and thanks to my collaborators. I'm going to skip my collaborator slide and just add that back. Um, so, so that's the end of the talk, and I think I am on time. <laughs> Thank you, Yin. Yeah, it's a great talk. And I guess since we are running out of time, if we have questions, we can send you an email. Would that right, be okay? Right. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much for the, yeah, for the talk. Mm. Okay. And thank you everyone for attending. Thanks.